Welcome to Washington Times Higher Ground. A lot to talk about today. Your new book, Revival, When God Comes to Church. Let's just start with that term, revival, because I think there's some confusion sometimes about the terminology and what it specifically refers to. When people say the word in the church, revival, what do they mean? Well, what the Bible means by it, what I believe is the best definition of revival in Scripture is actually in the Old Testament. You know, there were revivals in the Old Testament, and there were certainly revivals in the New Testament. But it's where uh, the Bible says the glory of God filled the house of God. I love that. And that uh, statement comes several times. It's always connected, uh, at least in Exodus and in the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, it's always connected with the cloud that would follow the people of God, literally would lead the people of God, but uh, the people would follow the cloud and uh, the glory of God coming to them through that cloud, the presence of Almighty God. And uh, I think that's what it is. I think that, you know, for Christians, there is a difference somewhat because we know that when we're saved, the Holy Spirit baptizes us into the body of Christ. That's what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 12. And that's really the picture of salvation, where he baptizes us <clears throat> into Christ. Literally, he drowns us into Christ. And then we open up and we receive the Spirit of God. And it's really a beautiful picture. And uh, we're in Christ. But at the same time, we need fresh fillings every day. And I believe that's what uh, the Bible is talking about in uh, Ephesians 5, where it talks to be fill, filled with the Holy Spirit. It's a filling from within. It's, it's like Jesus said to the woman at the well, rivers of living water shall flow out of you. And so that's what I'm talking about. It can be a personal revival for you or for me, but it, it can also be for a larger group, our church. It could even be for multiple churches in a town that came together for prayer, fasting, repentance, and crying out to God. And you know, when we cry out to God, he pours out his spirit upon us. So that's what I believe revival is. It's when the glory of God fills the house of God, individually, in a local church, or corporately across America or around the world. You know, it's interesting, you know, talking about the church, because a lot of times when revival is thrown out there as a term, people will often be using it to reference the culture changing, people coming to Christ for the first time in droves, let's say. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because it, it, you know, revival itself is more, it sounds, within the church. What would it be then? What term would we use to talk about when the church has revival and suddenly it pours over into the culture? Well, if you look at the book of Acts, which I think our churches today need to look like the book of Acts. That's the original. And uh, I'm afraid that, you know, a lot of people are looking at other churches trying to be like them. And I'm not saying you can't learn from anybody, but I am saying, why copy a copy when you can copy the original? And so what I believe uh, happens is when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, one of the things that you're going to want to do is to tell non-Christians and, you know, Jesus called them lost. Uh, you know, that's verbiage that are, or words that vernacular that we really don't like, but they are lost. They're, they're without Christ. They're without hope. And they are en route to an eternity that will be like their life on earth. Right now they're separated from God and they're going to be separated from God if they don't come to Christ. So when we are filled with the Holy Spirit and the cloud of God comes upon us, one of the first things that happened in the book of Acts when the Spirit of God came upon them, is they started speaking in other languages so that the people could hear and so that they could hear it in their own language. I love that. So that they could be saved. And that day when Peter tied the knot, if you will, he gave the invitation. And the Bible says in chapter 2 that 3,000 people were saved that day. So I believe that there's nothing... Uh, revival is for the people of God. If you think about the little prefix re uh, and the word vibe means life. It means new life. It means a fresh anointing, a freshness of life that already exists. And so when that happens, like you're a Christian, I'm a Christian. 
we can be revived. A lost person, a non-Christian, this is bad English, but it's great theology, needs to be vived. <laughs> they need life. They just need to have the life of God come in them. So they, a lost person can't be revived, but he can benefit from us being revived if we will share the gospel with him. And so I believe one of the greatest signs of true revival is not just people, you know, I, I'm grateful for Christians repenting of their sins and all of that. I'm grateful for Christians getting right with God and reconciling with people they've been estranged from. But that's not enough. Man, we've got to have that desire like they had in the book of Acts, all through the book of Acts, all 28 chapters. I mean, at the very end, Paul is witnessing to people. And so at the very beginning, they're praying. They pray for 10 days. God pours out his spirit. 3,000 people get saved. We pray for 10 minutes. <laughs> you know, Paul preached for about an hour, but they prayed for 10 days. We pray for about an hour, maybe. And then we preach for 10 days and hardly anybody gets saved. But we need to pray and seek God, get anointed with the Holy Spirit, and then share the gospel with that anointing. And I'm telling you, when you do that, every kind of person you can imagine will become to Christ. It doesn't matter what sin they've committed. I'm telling you, Jesus Christ can forgive any sin that anyone has ever committed. So that's what I mean by revival and the effects of it on non-Christians. Uh, it's, it's permanent, but it is persuasive, and it is absolutely biblical in the book of Acts. Well, yeah, and and prayer being such a centerpiece, you know, so many people have gotten away from prayer or it's such a quick thing they do and they move on from and they try to operate in their own, you know, wisdom, which can be dangerous. Um, obviously, as Christians, we know that. But let me ask you this, because you mentioned looking like, you know, the churches in Acts, you know, why would we copy a copy instead of going to the original? Why do you think so many churches today, in your view, have moved away from what we see happening in Acts? I think the book of Acts either comforts you or makes you uncomfortable because it's pretty obvious that, uh, and I'm not in any way meaning to be uh, disrespectful or demeaning at all. I, you know, it takes no size to criticize, but I have been pastoring the church, churches, four of them. <laughs> I've pastored four different churches over the last 41 years. And I can tell you uh, most of the churches that I see out there, if I go preaching or wherever, we don't really look like the book of Acts. And, and here's what I mean. We are more content to be in our buildings. We think that something about this structure around us is the church. And I don't mean to be ugly, but you know, you'll hear people saying, don't run in church. They're like to a little kid or something like that, you know, running in church. Well, you can't run in church because the church is not a building. The church is the redeemed, people of God. And so redeemed humanity is the church. So the people in Africa that meet under a tree, that's the church. And I've been in Africa. I've met with many people under trees. And that's just as much of a church as us meeting here at Bellevue Baptist Church. We've got a big sanctuary, but it's not the church. And so I believe that uh, what people are doing is they're focusing primarily on their buildings. They're focusing on people joining their church, you know, non-Christian or, or Christians rather coming from another assembly to their church. Well, that's great and that's wonderful, but you don't even hear about that in the New Testament. You All you hear about is people who are lost being saved. That's how people join the, and that's the major the, the church, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's what we need to focus on is getting them in the church through salvation and then helping them grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You can't be discipled. And by the way, that word is never used as a verb in the New Testament, but I'll use it that way anyway. Uh, you can't be discipled if you're not a disciple. And every Christian is a disciple, even either a mature one or a, an immature one. So I just believe that we go after them. Every Christian is supposed to share the gospel and see, see people get saved with their family, the people with whom they work, and the people around them in their neighborhood. They need to share the gospel. But they also then, after they get saved, need to take them in, 
teaches them how to read the Bible, teaches them how to pray. And the way you, the way you learn, you, you mentioned prayer specifically. Uh, I believe the way you learn to pray is to pray with someone who knows how to pray. That's what I believe. And I think that's the quickest route to learn how to talk. We are, you know, a little baby learns how to talk by the parents teaching that little baby how to talk. And we ought to teach baby Christians how to talk with God. Yeah, that's that's a powerful word there. And, you know, you look at sort of the state of the church right now. There's a lot of controversies. You see a lot of headlines about pastors who have fallen. There's a lot going on. And there's nothing new under the sun, but we see these things happening in headlines. When you in your role, and obviously you've, you know, headed up a denomination, you've pastored church, you've written books, you've done a lot in this space. What do you think are the biggest challenges facing modern churches today? Well, I think that, it is to be disciplined and people don't like that word, but I believe that disciple, you know, is the root word of discipline. And I think we need to discipline ourselves for the purpose of godliness. And one of the things that I think I I'm a, I'm a simple guy. Okay. <laughs> I'm from Dyersburg, Tennessee, and my parents were country folks, but uh, I'm just kind of a simple guy. I believe that every day you and I as Christians need to wake up, and within the first hour or so, we need to have our face in the word of God. I think we need to pray. I think you need to begin your word, your day in the word of God. And when you start listening to God, and what I do is, you know, sometimes I'm not fully awake, okay, when I wake up. So I read it out loud. And, I, you know, I, I just enjoy, I've got a one-year Bible, a chronological Bible, which is fantastic. And I've read the Bible through, I don't know, probably 30 times. I don't know what. I'm 66 years old. How many ever times I've read the Bible? But I've, one year I read it through three times. I said, I'll never do that again. Wow, <laughs> but, in one uh, year. <laughs> in one year, yeah. Yeah, that was not the wisest thing I ever did. I'm, I'm, I'm sure God used it, but I mean, it was a little bit too much. But uh, I, I just believe that that's the first thing you do. Just get, I think there are good habits that you can discipline yourself to make. And the next thing I do is I talk with God in prayer. Now think about this. I believe God talks to us through the Bible and through the promptings of the Holy Spirit. I believe that. And then I think, so I want God talking to me. What God has to say is much more important than what I have to say in my daily conversations with God. And I say conversations because I don't just, I try to pray throughout the day then. But I pray, I start off, there's something about seeking first the kingdom of God and the king. And when we come to God first, God just likes to be first. He's not egotistical. He's not some tyrant, but he is our loving heavenly father. And I tell you, when, when my kids, I've got four children. I've got, hey, by the way, I've got 18 grandbabies, all right? <laughs> 18 grandbabies, wow. 18, and I love it when they come up and say, Papa, you know, and, you know, I love it. I think God loves it when we come up to him and say, Abba, Abba, I need your help today. I can't do this interview. I can't even get dressed, dear God. I can't even overcome cancer, dear God. I, I've got you and I need you. I can't even talk. I can't even think. I can't function. I can't drive. I can't do anything. I can't love my wife. I can't love you, Lord, unless you help me. And I think when we come to him like that, and just say, help. I believe he loves us so much. And he pours out his spirit upon us. And then all of a sudden we got this conversation going. And he starts talking to us out of the Bible. And we start talking to him in prayer. And man, that's the way to begin the day right there. And I think if you'll do that, I think the rest of the day will be better. And then I think also you'll come back to scripture. You may memorize some scripture. You may whatever. But you'll be praying off and on all day. That's the way to have a great day. That's the way to keep from falling into sin. You know, you're not going to be doing anything you shouldn't be doing if you're walking with God. You know, as you're saying all that, you know, I, I'm sure people know this, but not everybody might. You've been facing a struggle with cancer and a battle with cancer. And so to hear you say those things and give that advice at a time where you've had to, I'm sure, lean into a lot of those things yourself as you've navigated through this what, you know, and this is a little bit unrelated, but I think it's really important to the conversation itself. 
What has God taught you most throughout this cancer journey? Well, you know, uh, I have a also an autoimmune disease called myasthenia gravis, which means weak muscles. And uh, my neck muscles have been very weak and my head kind of goes over like that. Uh, so I have to wear a collar and all that. But I think what the Lord has taught me is this, that I have to rely on his word. And every morning I wake up, I read my Bible, but then I pray scripture. I know I'm sure you've done that before where you get a Bible verse. Well, I had, I don't know how many people, there's no telling, uh, text me verses on healing, but also just encouraging verses. And so I've probably got several hundred verses that I've lined up on Evernote in my iPad. And I pray them back to the Lord on a regular basis. I, I've got so many, I can't pray them all in one day. But like this morning, when I got through reading the Bible, God spoke to me and then I just got my verses out and I had a little mark there where I had ended and I started doing that again. I also listened to sermons. I listened to Christian music. And, uh, you know, I grew up listening to country music. The problem with country music is people are leaving their wives, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're getting drunk. They're doing things. I'm like, I don't need that. So once in a blue moon, I'll listen to a little country music, but when it goes south, I turn it off. But so I, I just enjoy. I remember when I first got saved at 18, I started listening to Andre Crouch and man, that music was fantastic. I still listen to it. I go to YouTube. And so I just enjoy bathing my brain in scripture, bathing my Hold the Holy Spirit bathing me in just the word, the music of God. You know, I don't know what we're going to do when we get to heaven. I thought, no, we're not going to just stand around and sing. But I do think we're going to worship the Lord in song in some ways. I think we're going to worship him. And so I'm just trying to get ready to go to heaven, man. I'm not, I'm not worried about it. I believe with all my heart. I'll tell you, Billy, I, I honestly believe God gave me some verses and people talk about that, but I believe in that. In Psalm 118, he says, I will not die, but I will live and declare the works of the Lord. The Lord has disciplined me. That means he has discipled me severely. I'm going to write a book on severe discipleship. <laughs> and so, and so I, he has dis disciplined me severely, but he's not given me over to death. I believe that. I believe that. I believe God is healing me. And I could sit here and tell you that some of the cancer, like the cancer that was in my lungs, it was, I mean, it was all over my lungs. It's all gone, all gone. Every spot is gone. And so I believe it's diminishing. I believe God's going to heal me through miracle medicine or both. And I just believe that because I, I pray the scripture. I believe the word. And so that's where I stand. And, you know, God is good no matter what. I'm going to praise him. And uh, I, that's, but I believe he's going to heal me. Well, I, I love that, and we're praying for that. And I will say for a last question for you, just when we when we come back to the book, Revival, When God Comes to Church, at the end of the day, people are going to hear this interview, they're going to listen to it. When they finish the book, what is it that you want them thinking and feeling? What I want them to do is get with a group in their church, not uh, in any way, you know, being subversive to the pastor, you know, you got to be under his authority because he's under the Lord's authority as the leader. But just start praying for him and for revival. Pray for your pastor. I can tell you, I tell my people all the time, if y'all pray better, I'll preach better, okay? <laughs> so I just believe that if we pray for the leadership, you know, everything, as John Maxwell says, everything rises and falls on leadership. And so I just believe if we'll pray for our leaders, pray for our deacons, pray for our elders, pray for our pastors, and then pray for ourselves. Pray for our families. I pray that I think that people, if they'll read this book and get a group together, not to change the church in a rebellious way, but to come just with an open heart and say, Oh God in heaven, we need you now. Please open the windows of heaven and pour out your spirit upon us. And I believe if we do that, God is more than willing to do it. You know, Jesus, and I'll close with this Jesus in Revelation 3.20 was knocking on the door, not of our hearts. I heard a pastor say that is he's knocking on your heart's door trying to get in. That is not what that means. He's knocking on the door of his church 
trying to, the, the church at Laodicea had locked him out of his own church. And I believe Jesus is knocking on the door of a lot of our churches. If we'll just open the door and say, Jesus, it's your church, whatever you want. That's when God comes to church. Well, I love that. That is such an amazing place for us to close. Appreciate you joining us, taking the time today to share some of your wisdom and pointing people towards a better understanding of revival. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, and I'm honored to be with you. Thank you for having me.